through the end of the 90s and the start of the noughties, I was one of countless people with awesome taste in television that was engrossed in the ongoing saga known as Buffy the Vampire Slayer. The story of this incredible young woman chosen to fight evil, who saved the world a lot. After seven years as they drew the story to a conclusion, Buffy destroyed the world's first evil and closed the hellmouth. And as she and her Scooby gang of closest friends stood around the smouldering crater, realising that because of her victory, Buffy's great power had been shared abroad with the rest of the world and that no one ever had to be afraid of the dark again, Buffy looked out with this hopeful smile and they asked her, what are we going to do now? And it cut to black. And it was like, come on, is that it? What are they going to do now? Fair dinkum, leave it on a cliffhanger. What happens next? They're as bad as those guys who were making movies back in the 50s, 60s and 70s who had no problem leaving you on the edge of a cliff, literally in the middle of their story. Only we, the viewer, can decide later on how it ends when we're churned up thinking about it a week later. But you know what? That's exactly how Mark's account of the good news of Jesus ends. Mark has told the story of Jesus like someone in a hurry, like he's writing the script for an action movie. Jesus appears out of nowhere, preaching forgiveness and the immediate arrival of God's kingdom. He heals people, casts out demons and performs other signs that underline his message of the good news. Supernatural and human forces have enough. They team up against him. He's betrayed. He's abandoned by his best mates. He's tried in a secret court hearing. He's tried by media. He is tortured, mocked and then killed. His ruined corpse is laid in a tomb. But then at sunrise on the third day, as unexpected as a car crash, as unexpected as the end of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, there's an angel appearing in light. Don't pack your dax, ladies. He ain't here. He's risen. And here's where you'll find him. Many believe Mark's proper ending was torn off the end of the script and thrown away or lost and that he couldn't possibly have meant for this account to end with everyone running away in terror. After all, we know from the other accounts that these are extraordinary women and those accounts celebrate them and their courage as the first witnesses to the resurrection. And they also have these lengthy accounts of some of Jesus' other resurrection appearances. Yet Mark isn't interested in all that. He's telling an action story and he tells it in a punchy dot point style so others think he actually meant to end it on a cliffhanger. Whatever the case, we're left in the same place. Mark's account of the gospel still ends on a cliffhanger at verse 8. Jesus is risen. So if the only witnesses flee in terror, how is anyone ever going to hear about it? Who is going to tell the story? of the good news. Anglicans can be pretty good at doing good for others, serving people in a wide variety of extremely generous and sacrificial ways. And you know what? This is extremely commendable. I love how people do that. And they're following in the footsteps of Jesus doing that and our Father in Heaven smiles upon that. And it's a genuine way to bring healing to people in their attitudes towards our dad in heaven and his church. But we Anglicans have this unstated belief that that's enough in our job as witnesses to the resurrection. We think, well, they know I love them. They know I go to church. They know I love God and think that's the sum total of Christian witness without ever speaking a word about King Jesus or about his story, about how he's changed our lives and how he continues to work in our lives day by day. There's no use leaving it to the priest. I mean, he goes on three-week holidays. You can't ring up and send send someone to talk to him. You can't rely on someone else. You are in the front seat on this one. 
There are no magic words to share the good news, only your words. Only you are well placed to talk about God's story in your life, in your own words. But there must be words, because in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. In a way, Anglicans have probably watched way too much Silent Witness and taken that title to heart. The whole New Testament, indeed, the whole of Scripture is about sharing in the story of God and sharing the story of God in our lives. In Mark's account, the healings, the exorcisms and the other signs of power and the other miracles are dramatic and life-changing for everyone involved, but they are very much a sideshow to Jesus' unrelenting desire to talk about his dad in heaven and just how good and forgiving and merciful and loving he is. Basically, Jesus wants to talk about his dad at every turn. The very thing we Anglicans flee in fear and terror from. May it never be said of us on the last day that they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. You are the ending of Jesus' story and the beginning of a new one. So what are you going to do now? The Lord says to you tonight, do not be afraid. You are the end of Jesus' story. Go and tell the good news. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Let us pray.